Hello, this is Jolith O'Neill Dunn with the University of Vermont, and this presentation, Mapping the Green Infrastructure, is a recap of a talk that I gave at the eCognition User Summit in November 2009 in Munich, Germany. So, we have lots of good data out there, remotely sensed data, aerial and satellite imagery, or LiDAR data sets, a whole host of vector data sets, building footprints, road polygons, and cadastral data sets, but yet we lack some really basic information in our green infrastructure, and we can't answer sometimes some simple questions, such as how much tree canopy do we have, how much room is there to plant trees, or perhaps what is the breakdown of tree canopy by different land use types. However, when we combine data with object-based image analysis technology, then we can generate information. So we have our high-resolution aerial or satellite imagery, our LiDAR or light detection and ranging data set, and using object-based image analysis software such as eCognition, we can generate high-resolution land cover. By incorporating our cadastral records such as property parcel boundaries, we can then generate some very useful maps such as this depiction of percent tree canopy per property parcel, or this one, which is the amount of land available for tree canopy for each property parcel. Of course, we can bring in cadastral land use records and then summarize the information in a way that's meaningful for decision makers. This graph here shows that existing UTC, that is the current urban tree canopy, is greatest in residential areas, and the most room for planting tree canopy, that is the possible UTC, is fairly consistent in the exempt commercial and residential areas. Of course, in order to do this type of analysis, we really need a system. So I'd like to talk about object-based image analysis systems from both a requirements perspective and a components perspective. We see the requirements as being, firstly, to replicate the human. We need highly accurate, high-quality land cover data. And we don't want to have to go out and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on new remotely sensed data acquisition, so we want to be able to leverage existing data. And finally, none of this matters unless we can provide an economic advantage. Specifically, we want to make sure that it's much more cost effective than traditional methods such as manual and image interpretation. So what are the components of the object-based image analysis system? Well, first we need a way to take this information that's in our imagery analyst's head and translate that into an automated method. And expert systems provide an excellent mechanism for doing that. We have lots of data out there. It may be raster remotely sensed data, it may be LiDAR data and point clouds, it may be building polygons and water polygons in vector format. We need to make sure that our OBIA system handles all of these types of data. And then finally, none of this is going to really work with today's very large data sets unless we can leverage enterprise computing architecture. I'd like to show you some examples of how we've employed object-based image analysis technology using the eCognition software for one specific example, in this case Jefferson County, West Virginia. Jefferson County is not one of the largest projects we worked on, but it certainly provided some very interesting points of discussion for this talk. So the area 550 square kilometers, a real mix of everything from rather dense urban areas to rural agricultural and forested landscapes. We only made use of readily, freely available data for this project. So we had access to imagery from 2007. It was color infrared three bands, rather large 1.15 billion pixels acquired through the USDA's National Agricultural Imagery Program. We also had access to LIDAR. It was acquired two years earlier, different specifications, of course, by the Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS. Once again, quite a large data set, 1.8 billion points there. That was a point cloud with classification, meaning that the ground points were identified so we could generate a digital elevation model normalized digital surface model as well, depicting the height of features relative to the ground. And finally, we were able to leverage Jefferson County's existing investment in their GIS data sets, specifically building outlines, road and driveway center lines, and water polygons, total of over 44,000 individual vector features. One of the great things about eCognition software that allows us to do true multi-sensor data fusion. 
Here are some examples of the remotely sensed data we used in this project. Over on the left, LiDAR intensity data, so the strength of the signal returned to the LiDAR sensor there. One of the problems with LiDAR intensity data, and you can see that in this example, is that it does change relative to scan lines. You can see the scan line seam of the LiDAR here as those LiDAR tiles were mosaic, but still a lot of valuable information. In the center, we have the color infrared aerial imagery. And then over on the right, the normalized digital surface model, or NDSM, depicting the height of features relative to the ground. One of the issues we struggled with early on in some of these larger projects is figuring out how we're going to split up our data so that we can ensure that it distributes out to multiple cores to take advantage of enterprise computing. Uh, the reason being that quite often, even for an uh, area like Jefferson County, making use of enterprise processing, the classification process can take hours or sometimes even days. And with out going to a multi-core processing environment, that would quickly extend to weeks or months. And the best method that we came up with was something that we call overlapping tiles. And if you consider our existing data set to be this gray rectangle in the center of the screen, the overlapping tile process first involves chunking our data up into overlapping tiles. Each one of these tiles has 10% overlap. These tiles are then processed using the exact same classification system to generate the land cover data. And then they are mosaiced into a single data set, so the land cover data is raster, by shooting a cut line down the center. And by using the exact same rule set or expert system on each one of those tiles and having the 10% overlap, we have yet to see any noticeable edge effects when we do the final mosaic to generate a seamless land cover product, such as what you see here, represented by this green rectangle. Were it not for the customized import functionality within eCognition, batch processing would be exceedingly cumbersome. We're able to load in all of our imagery and LiDAR datasets using consistent naming conventions, in addition to bringing in all of our thematic or vector datasets. eCognition gives us a workspace environment from which we can batch process or classify all of those different tile data sets, making use of enterprise computing architecture. eCognition also gives us a powerful way to replicate the human. Of course, replicating the human requires that we adhere to the elements of photo interpretation, perhaps now better known as the elements of image interpretation, that are things such as shape, size, tone, pattern, texture, site, and association. Of course, for much of the last four decades, any automated land cover classification of remotely sensed data was done only using spectral information, or only one of the elements of Im image interpretation, tone. Of course, this is the farthest thing from human cognition as possible, which is why we've seen over the last few decades some very unsatisfactory results when it comes to land cover classification. These unsatisfactory results have become magnified as we've worked with higher resolution remotely sensed data, such as some of the imagery and LiDAR we have nowadays, where there's actually very little spectral color or tone information within those data sets. Most of the information is based on shape, size, context, pattern, site, association, and so forth. So we take a cognitive approach to object-based image analysis. We use image segmentation algorithms to generate image objects. But once we have those image objects, it's not just a simple process of classifying them. We'll often bounce back, resegment those image objects, apply image object fusion processes to group similar objects together, assign those image objects to temporary classes, perhaps segment them again, use morphology algorithms to change their shape so that they more accurately represent our features of interest until we end up with a final classification. So this is an iterative process. And this iterative process requires that we have a rather detailed class hierarchy. So in the case of Jefferson County, we only generated a land cover data set with seven classes, but we used three to four times that many classes in the process to assign features to temporary classes to store that information, to build that semantic knowledge, to then go ahead and generate the final land cover classification. To do the actual feature extraction, we had to find a mechanism to translate the knowledge 
for land cover mapping that was in an experienced image analyst's mind into an expert system or rule set. And we did this within the eCognition environment by using CNL with a cognition network language. This is an example of the rule set that we generated for the Jefferson County project. It comes in at 24 pages when exported to Microsoft Word and it's very, very detailed. It also yields very, very accurate land cover data. So although this rule set may seem lengthy, we estimate that it probably saved us 20 to 30 times from what it would have taken to do manual image interpretation. The other benefit of this rule set is that it's very easy to understand. Using cognition network language, we take a step-by-step -step approach so that when we generate an initial version of the land cover data and observe any errors, it's very easy to go back into the rule set, make the necessary adjustments, and fix the errors. Using artificial intelligence, genetic algorithms, or neural networks, it's often quite difficult to figure out exactly what the cause of the error is when you do an initial land cover classification. This is one of the real advantages of expert systems. As I mentioned, we wanted to make sure that we leveraged existing data sets as much as possible. And Jefferson County had a building polygon data set. Unfortunately, as you see here, particularly in the case of this building in the upper left on the LIDAR and here in the imagery, the buildings, while they accurately show the location of the buildings, they're not very accurate with respect to the shape and the size. So using eCognition software, we brought these polygons in. We then built a rule that reduced the size or shrunk those image polygons based on the normalized digital surface model. We then had another image segmentation and classification process to find all the tool features. And then we began an iterative growing process to grow those buildings into areas that appeared based on some of the LIDAR and imagery characteristics to look like they could be buildings. The end result was that we had a much more accurate representation of buildings by using the vector data set in combination with the imagery in the LIDAR and leveraging the tools in eCognition. We also incorporated some image processing functionality within eCognition. In this case, we used the LIDAR normalized digital surface model, what you see in the center there, and applied a slope algorithm to it. The advantage of applying the slope algorithm to the normalized digital surface model is that small features such as the tree here highlighted in yellow, which barely show up on the LiDAR data set, show up quite clearly in the slope-derived LiDAR data set. We also used image processing functionality to smooth out the LiDAR data set, particularly useful in those areas where we had a pixelated effect over forest canopy. And as I mentioned before, using the Cognition Network Language, or CNL, we take a stepwise approach to feature extraction. In this case, we're looking at the buildings in red. Those were extracted using the method that I mentioned earlier. The features in this orange-yellow color there are tall features extracted through a threshold segmentation from the LiDAR normalized digital surface model. And then the features in blue are those that were extracted from the LiDAR normalized digital surface model slope layer, so those that have high slope. So here we have in red buildings, orange features that are tall, and in blue features that have high slope. And we found that the features in blue, those with high slope, very good for detecting small trees. Unfortunately, the slope layer tends to overestimate tree canopy for those larger patches of forest. So we ran a rule that first reclassifies or splits off those small trees based on their shape and size. We then remove the slope classification for those larger patches of trees, and then we combine those temporary classes into a final tree canopy class. One of the downsides of doing threshold-based feature extraction from LiDAR data is that we end up with some very jagged edges. You can see here that the tree canopy depicted in green it has an unrealistic shape and thus it's not very cartographically pleasing. So we designed a growing and shrinking routine that's reusable with some minor changes to make morphology operations on a target and active class. So in this case the active class, that's the, act, that's the class that we want to grow and shrink, is the tree canopy. So that's assigned to the active class yellow 
and then the areas that we want to grow and shrink it into are assigned to the target class, which is depicted in purple. We begin by defining a focus area. This is done to reduce memory consumption, so that's essentially a buffer around the active class, the tree canopy in this case. Within that focus area, we then create pixel size image objects, and then we perform a growing operation based on contextual information, specifically the relative border to the active class, to grow the tree canopy out. And as you can see here, the result of that growing operation is a much smoother representation of tree canopy. The downside, of course, is that we begin to overestimate tree canopy. So then we do the reverse operation. We grow in, defining the focus area as indicated in orange, and then reverting to the final classification. As you'll notice, we have a much smoother representation of the tree canopy objects. Morphology was also necessary for buildings, so we applied a very similar routine there. We just adjusted the parameters slightly. So the parameters were adjusted in this case not to make the nice round objects necessary for tree canopy, but to try and make the straight edges one would expect to see on a building. So there's our original building objects. We use this target active and focus area operations. So the active class here is buildings. That's the one we want to adjust the morphology of. We have the focus area, which is the orange area. That's the buffer that we target for the work to reduce memory consumption. We then perform those growing and shrinking operations, similar to what we did before, straightening out the edges, and then revert back to the original classification. So this is a morphology algorithm that involves about 30 different processes and a lot of contextual information that can be reused for various land cover classes. Incorporating vector data was also necessary to define the road features. In Jefferson County, the only road data set available was road center lines. We used the road center line information and first started off with a focus area for our operations. We then began an iterative classification process that consisted of image segmentation, image object fusion, morphology and temporary classification in this growing operation to extract the road polygons. And then what you end up here with is a very realistic representation of road features within the county. We also made use of the object hierarchy capabilities within eCognition. This was very useful for replicating human cognition, something that's known as the gist of the scene. So in reading some of the neuroscience literature, we discovered that humans are very, very good about making some key assumptions of imagery very, very quickly. In this case, of course, we would know to look for impervious surfaces only within urban areas and ignore these small bright features that appear very, very similar to impervious surfaces out in the rural landscape. So we wanted to first define the urban area, and then within the urban area do a much more detailed image segmentation and classification of those objects. So to this point in time, based on the processes I've shown you so far, we've got tree canopy, buildings, and roads extracted. And by using the image object hierarchy, we could first narrow down the area we wanted to search for to define this urban area. And then we could incorporate a host of contextual classification operations to assign image objects to this urban area category, which is what's depicted here in brown. And once we had that urban area defined, we could do this higher resolution feature extraction to focus on impervious surface features only within that urban area. The result is what you see here, the cyan features which accurately represent impervious surfaces. This was possible, of course, through the multi-sensor data fusion, where we were able to make use of information in the LiDAR intensity data and spectral information from the imagery data set to get the best possible classification of impervious surface features within the urban area. One of the problems of using both LiDAR and imagery, especially in this case, is the two data sets sometimes did not overlay correctly, and in fact they had offsets of up to five meters, was that we had some rather nasty edge effects. And you can see that here, where we have offset from the buildings leading to these unrealistic 
impervious edge features in many cases, and so we felt that we could incorporate some contextual operations to clean up that information. That is, we know that we wouldn't expect to see a small impervious surface like this on the edge of a building. So we started out by first realizing that we probably needed to do a little bit of growing to grow out at a pixel level those impervious surfaces to expand them. And then we developed an edge, edge detection routine that went in and searched for impervious surfaces that appeared to be in unrealistic locations. And then we began a competitive growing routine that said all other land cover crosses go into, grow into those edge areas to remove them. And this ended up with what we felt was a better representation of impervious surface features, removing some of those ugly edge effects that we had before. We also developed some customized image object fusion routines in order to generate more meaningful objects. When one generates more meaningful objects within an object-based image analysis environment, it becomes much easier to apply the elements of image interpretation to classify those image objects. So in this case, we're looking at the result of image objects created through our existing classification. You can see we've got image objects that represent things such as the tree canopy and the buildings very, very well. In this case, where our image object fusion is going to focus on generating meaningful objects to represent the agricultural areas. Here we're looking at a fine scale classification of the LiDAR intensity data set and those same image objects, only this time overlaid on the color infrared aerial imagery. If we apply a spectral difference segmentation, that is combine those image objects that appear spectrally similar in the LiDAR and imagery data sets, this is what we end up with. These objects are quite good, but you can still see that in some cases we have objects belonging to a single field that are of varying size. So this is less than desired. So we built a routine which first selects the largest object in the scene, and you can see that in this case it's the object highlighted in yellow here, this large field. It then begins to evaluate the smaller objects around it that it has a high relative border to, and if those objects are similar, it consumes them and they become part of the larger object. Once that object has been evaluated, it's assigned to this temporary class in magenta, and the routine continues going to the next largest image object. So a slightly different perspective here, using filled in colors, we can see that these two objects have been evaluated, and that this object in yellow here is the object that's currently being evaluated. And so the target objects are going to be the smaller neighbor objects. In this case, this small object here, and then some of these other edge objects and some of the objects in the center. So they're being evaluated for their similarity, and if they're similar enough, they are consumed by the larger object. That object is then, of course, assigned to the class, indicating that it has been evaluated and it's complete, and the process continues. The end result of the previous steps, some of those threshold segmentations and height segmentations and classifications I showed earlier to get at the canopy in the buildings, along with the road feature extraction, and then finally these image object fusion techniques, is that we have image objects that look very, very similar to what we would expect a human to generate through manual heads-up digitizing. The end result of all of this work is that we end up with consistent output. So whether we zoom in at a fine scale to some of these rather dense residential areas, or we zoom out to look at our very heterogeneous landscape where we have sparse residential areas mixed with forest polygons and a rural agricultural landscape, we see that we have a very, very stable land cover classification generated in an automatic framework for the entire 550 square kilometers. That concludes this presentation. I'd like to thank the USDA Forest Service and National Science Foundation, both of whom funded some of the initial work that went into developing these techniques, and then of course the Jefferson County Commission, who we partnered with on this particular project.